The five main beaches of the D-Day landings were given the code names of Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno and Sword. The British and Canadian beaches were originally named after fish, goldfish, swordfish and jellyfish. The code name Jelly Beach sounded inappropriate for a place where soldiers would die, so Winston Churchill had it changed to Juno. Juno Beach, extending from La Riviere to St Albans St Mayor, was assaulted by the 3rd Canadian Division, commanded by Major General Rod Keller. The Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe, codenamed Operation Overlord, was referred to by Canadians as Operation Overboard. At Juno Beach, the defences were stronger than at many other landing sectors. The Canadians were highly trained and courageous troops. Their strength was in the quality of their junior officers. The beach between high and low water was a devil's garden of obstacles, many with mines attached. Strong points bristled with machine guns, mortars, anti-tank and anti-personnel artillery. To their front were entanglements of barbed wire and protecting their flanks, minefields. The bombing of Juno Beach by the RAF and Royal Canadian Air Force was ineffective, with very little damage to enemy defences. 0530 hundred hours, the cruiser HMS Belfast commenced fire. Shortly after, HMS Diadem targeted the Beni Mare battery, which was quickly silenced. 06100 hours, 11 destroyers, including two Canadian destroyers, HMCS Algonquin and HMCS Sioux, moved closer to the shore to attack enemy positions. The sea was too rough to launch the DD tanks at the planned distance, so the LCTs launched them several hundred yards from the beach. HMCS Prince David disembarked her troops, French Canadians from the Lower St Lawrence, on schedule opposite Bernier's Samaire. As they approached the beach, it was some comfort to the troops to hear the salvos of screaming high explosive rockets fired over their heads. But it was all noise and little else as the rockets fell short of the enemy, landing harmlessly in the sea. 24 LCTs, each carrying four Priest self-propelled guns, fired on enemy positions from their landing craft as they approached the beach. The Canadians, seasick and drenched in spray, were surprised the German artillery had not opened fire on their landing craft. A hundred yards from the shore, the guns from the big ship stopped firing at the beach and the enemy burst into action. With artillery shells exploding around them, the wooden sides and thin armour of the landing craft offered little protection. In the longest minutes of their lives, the Canadian troops rode in on crashing waves. The landing craft weaved through a sea full of mine-covered stumps. At 07.4900 hours, as the ramps dropped, they became the targets of enemy field guns and machine guns. Shattered by artillery fire, peppered with machine gun fire, they made a wild scramble for the shore. The sea turned red with blood as desperate men, ripping the plastic coverings from their weapons, dashed to the relevant shelter of the sea wall. The sand around them churned with machine gun bullets and artillery shells as they were peppered with shingle, and by large wood splinters as landing craft blew up on mines. The 7th Canadian Brigade landed on both sides of the river cellar at corsel sur mer Their DD amphibious tanks arrived on shore and immediately went straight for the German bunkers. The Royal Winnipeg Rifles cleared the West Bank and with the Canadian Scottish regiments pushed towards Vuz and Grey St Mare. The East Bank proved a much harder than expected task to clear. The Regina Rifles had suffered heavy losses on landing and the town was heavily fortified. With the support of tanks, it took until the afternoon to clear the town fully. The 8th Canadian Brigade, landing at St Albans St Mare, had the misfortune of touching down in front of an extensive concrete bunker system armed with anti-tank guns, machine guns and mortars. They suffered heavy losses. The amphibious DD tanks of Fort Gary Horse, delayed by rough seas, were late to arrive. When they did arrive, in the chaos and their eagerness to destroy enemy positions, their tanks ran over the dead and even wounded men.
at 11.30 hundred hours, with the arrival of the specialised Avery tanks which fired bombs into the bunker system, the resistance came to an end. The North Shore Regiment used Bangalore torpedoes to blow gaps in the barbed wire entanglements to enter the town. They fought from house to house, with the enemy often reappearing behind them from a network of tunnels. At Bernier St. Mare, the Queen's own rifles, now reinforced by the tanks of the Fort Garry Horse, demolished strong points in houses. Again, the specialist Avery tanks proved invaluable, blowing gaps in the seawall through which infantry, Shermans and self-propelled artillery poured. As the enemy fled, French civilians emerged from their cellars. French Canadians, speaking to the local people in French, received an enthusiastic welcome, with wine offered and bars opened. But the Canadians could not dally and pushed inland. They were behind schedule. The preliminary bombardment had been ineffective. Heavy resistance, high casualties, chaos on the beaches and huge traffic jams meant the 9th Canadian Infantry had too little time to reach their main objectives. Major General Keller anticipating a counter-attack by the 21st Panzer Division at nightfall, dug in on a five-mile front from Kruli to Colombi. The Canadians stopped in sight of their objective, the Capique Airport, their tanks low on ammunition. Unbeknown to the Canadians, the fanatical 12th SS Hitler Youth Panzer Division moved in to Capique overnight. The 12th SS Hitler Youth Panzer Division cold-bloodedly murdered many Canadian prisoners of war. At Capique Airport, wounded Canadian troops and unarmed prisoners were shot. Eighteen Canadian prisoners were taken to the Abbey Arden. One at a time, they were questioned, taken outside and shot in the back of the head. During the D-Day campaign, 156 Canadian prisoners of war were murdered by the 12th SS Hitler Youth Panzer Division. The Canadians would clash time and again with the fanatical 12th SS Hitler Youth Panzer Division. The SS Hitler Youth Panzer Division would come off second best. Capique would see some of the most bitter fighting in the whole of Normandy and would remain in German hands until July. By the end of D-Day, 3,200 vehicles, 2,500 tonnes of materials and 15,000 men had been landed on Juno Beach. On D-Day, there were 961 Canadian casualties, killed, wounded or missing.